welcome. And we've got something a little bit different today. We're going to be diving not into a libertarian theory, but rather a theory of Karl Marx known as the labor theory of value. And we'll be debating the specific resolution that capitalists exploit workers in a free market by expropriating their surplus value from them. My first guest, he is taking the affirmative on this resolution. He is Professor of Economics Emeritus at the University of Massachusetts Amherst, where he taught economics from 1973 to 2008. He is currently a visiting professor in the Graduate Program in International Affairs of the New School University in New York City. He's also the host of the weekly television and radio show called Economic Update with Richard D. Wolf. Uh, that can be found on over 70 radio stations nationwide, and it's also available at youtube.com slash democracy at work. He has been a very outspoken in his criticism of, of capitalism and many aspects of the capitalist system. And most importantly, as you can tell by the fact that he's appearing on this program today and by the fact that he'll be debating uh, our good friend Gene Epstein at the Soho Forum, Forum later this year, he is very open to debate and the discussion of ideas. That is, of course, something I value very highly as well. So I am very pleased to welcome Dr. Richard Wolf. Thank you very much. I'm very uh, flattered that you're interested and that we can have this conversation. I am very flattered that you were happy to come on this program and join us today as well. And we'll get more into it in a minute. But first, I want to bring in my next guest. He is taking the negative in the proposition. He is a passionate voice, uh, both for the ideas of liberty as well as in the personal development space. He's authored several books, including Universal Basic Income for and Against, and his latest, which is quite a fun read, I have to say, called How to Make Small Talk. He co-hosts the Scottish Liberty Podcast, as well as the Be Yourself and Love It Podcast. He is making his third appearance on this program. I'm pleased to welcome back Mr. Anthony Samaroff. Anthony, how are you? Thank you. Great. I'm very glad to be here with you and Professor Wolf. Excellent, excellent. And uh, you guys, I was going to say you guys have something in common. Uh, that part is a little bit up in the air right now, but you were both scheduled to appear at the Soho Forum later on this year. Mr. Uh, Dr. Wolf, I should say, is uh, still scheduled to appear with Gene Epstein. But Anthony, something happened with your debate. Your opponent, you were scheduled to do a debate with Andrew Yang over the subject of automation. Um, I don't know what happened there, but he seems to have backed out of the debate. You're still scheduled for it, so we're not exactly sure what's, what's going to go on there. But uh, what, what exactly? happened there as far as you know? Well, we booked Andrew Yang in January and he seems to have got a lot more famous since then. So I don't, so his people weren't sure that his touring, his schedule would allow for it or perhaps he doesn't have much to gain from a debate with me, but he'd certainly have a lot to lose um, if me, a relatively unknown person, um, showed him up when he's about to appear for president. So the, it looks like that debate is going to be rescheduled for January and someone else will be taking the other, uh, the opposing position. Um, it's, it was a little bit of a disappointment because Gene had started selling t tickets and what have you. But I'm sure we'll get a fantastic debate in the end, wherever that takes place. And if not at the Soho Forum in January, then certainly tonight on the Lions of Liberty podcast. <laughs> there you go. One way or another, we're getting a good conversation out of this thing. <laughs> All right, well, gentlemen, I've got you both here. I'm very excited to get into this. Before we do, there's one thing I have to be sure of before we get started. Gentlemen, are you ready to roar? Um, yes, roar. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Richard. I think um, we'll snarl rather than roar. <laughs> oh, I don't even think we'll need to do that. I think this is a this is a topic that should have been debated much more than it has been. And so we're in the, in the nice position of inaugurating something that hopefully will continue uh, after we're done. Thank you. I agree. I think this uh, is a topic that hasn't got enough attention. And I'm very pleased to have you here because I know that you can give a very solid account of the the Marxist position and no one will be accusing me of um, debating an easy opponent because <laughs> you've, been, you've been at this um, Marxist economics for a long time. Yes, I have. And, and whether or not that makes me good at it, I guess we'll see. You know? 
<laughs> time will tell. Now, Richard, before we get into uh, the meat of the debate, since it is your first time on the show, I did tee you up with a little bit of a bio there. But I was wondering if you could just give the audience out there a little more of your, your personal story, maybe the, the elevator speech version of how you first became interested in, in economic ideas and you know, how you kind of came down this path where now you spend most of your time just sort of passionately advocating for, you know, for the things that you hold dear. Okay, very briefly. Um, when I was growing up, I uh, had either the good luck or the bad luck, depending on your perspective, to live in a suburb outside of New York City, a town called New Rochelle, about a half an hour outside of the city. My father, like so many in that town, worked in the big city and so commuted in and out every day uh, on the railroad. And uh, when he did that, he occasionally took me along. Uh, as his son, I was the first of uh, two children that he had. And the railroad that leaves New, New Rochelle and goes to New York City passes through a section of Manhattan called Harlem. And in Harlem at that time, it was a 100% uh, African American uh, community. And you could see from the train cars that the people there were poor, that the streets were not very clean, uh, the poverty was obvious. And as a young child, I asked my father, what was that about? Because it wasn't like New Rochelle, which is a, not an upscale, but a comfortable suburb and, and very white. Um, and he explained to me uh, that there are two Americas, uh, one that lives in one way that we're used to in New Rochelle, and another one that lives in other ways, one of which is exemplified by Harlem. And if I had to guess where my initial interest came, it came there. It came in the form of wanting to understand why that was. Why are things organized that way? Why did that story then lead to other stories of other similar dichotomies? And I got the idea of, of doing that. Um, and it stayed with me. And when I went to college, the first thing I, I wanted to do was to study economics. My parents were against it. They thought it was better for me to become a scientist. So I studied biochemistry until I couldn't stand it anymore uh, and switched over. And I took a course in economics. I wanted to understand basically the same question Adam Smith did. You know, why are some nations rich? and other nations poor. What, what explains the wealth or not wealth of nations? Instead, my teacher um, at Harvard University, which is where I went to school, uh, threw an awful lot of graphs up on the board and a lot of equations. Um, I had studied mathematics, so the, the math was never a problem, but the relationship between this simple-minded math and the big questions I was interested was not only not evident, it was absent. And I asked questions and I was told uh, that's not what economics is about. I took that seriously and I went over and studied history instead. At the end of my college years, it was clear to me that to understand history, I had to learn that economics that I had not studied because it's so important to understand what happens in history. So I decided to go to graduate school in economics rather than stay with history. And so I completed an education in economics most of which was devoted, uh, I understood this later, not so much to an analysis of capitalism as it was to a celebration of it. My teachers thought it was the greatest thing since white bread had been sliced and explained to me over and over again how wonderful it was and why we should all join in the cheerleading that they were uh, specialists at. I kept asking questions about inequality and uh, unequal development and all those kinds of questions. And basically, it's not so much that I got bad answers, I didn't get any answers. It, it, it wasn't what they were interested in. They didn't understand economics that way. And so I became frustrated and began to look, is there something other that I can study in the way of economics? And so I began, looking for other voices. I found them and eventually I found my way to Marxism, uh, particularly to the work of Karl Marx, found it wonderfully attentive to the very things I was interested in. Uh, by the way, it was through Marx that I ended up reading Adam Smith and David Ricardo and people like that, 
because I assume many of you know, Marx was deeply respectful and appreciative of what he got from those people, as I have always been. Uh, they were also important teachers of mine. But I ended up being a critic of capitalism and inviting my professors all the way through. You know, persuade me otherwise. I, I, I'm, I'm open to it. I have no precondition here. They made an honest effort. Some of them were good at it. Some of them weren't. But the bottom line is they didn't persuade me and I became a critic and I've stayed a critic, uh, if anything, more so now than I was uh, back then because the intervening years have made me feel even more strongly that this is a system that the human race can do better than. So that's my position. All right, well, you might have had some professors give a go at it, but you have not encountered Anthony Samaroff yet. So, so we'll see. That's absolutely correct. That's correct. <laughs> We will see what kind of dents we can make. And, and Anthony, you know, as much as I'd love to hear your story, fans of the show have heard it before. So I'm just going to link uh, to your first appearance on this podcast. I'll link to both your appearances in the show notes today if they want to do it more of a deep dive on how Anthony Samaroff became a libertarian. But I think it's time now to move on to the meat of the debate. Again, the resolution is that capitalists exploit workers in a free market by expropriating their surplus value from them. Um, Professor Wolf, I'm going to start with you since this is uh, sort of your, your main wheelhouse here. Would you please take the time now to give your opening statement? Um, you know, and, and like I told you guys before the debate, I'm not timing these things. I'm not going to have a stopwatch. Uh, we're both adults. We can both sort of judge on our own what is a reasonable amount of, amount of time. But I'd ask you just sort of keep this in the three to five minute range. Your opening statement backing up this idea of the resolution that capitalists exploit workers in a free market by expropriating their surplus value from them. Take it away, Dr. Wolf. Sure. Um... I think the best way I could get into it in a summary fashion in three to five minutes would be to say that both Marx's labor theory of value and his theory of surplus value that's based on it were attempts of him to work out an explanation of capitalism from a critical standpoint. He did not, as many people apparently believe, invent the labor theory of value. He didn't do that because he didn't need to. Adam Smith had a labor theory of value. Ricardo took Adam Smith's and did some work on it. And Marx took what both of them had done and done some more work on it. But the labor theory of value is not the invention of Karl Marx, nor is it unique to him. But he did make use of it, thanking both Smith and Ricardo for having made it available to him in order to in understand what it was about the capitalist system that in his mind, prevented it as an economic system from realizing the objectives and the goals that had led early capitalists to promise that the revolution against feudalism, whether it took place in France of 1789 or the United States in 1774 or elsewhere, which had made such glorious promises of bringing liberty, equality, fraternity, democracy, why the capitalist system, which sincerely thought it could and would do that, failed to do that. By the time Marx comes along, roughly 50 years after all of that, uh, he looks around and capitalism is everywhere, but liberty, equality, fraternity, and democracy, not at all. And so he set himself the goal of understanding what it was about capitalism as a system that could explain why the promises it made that brought many people to support the revolution into capitalism had not been realized. And the, th the theory of surplus value is his answer. And it goes roughly like this. And rather than recapitulate his language, let me use a modern uh, formulation and then stop, okay? It goes like this. Imagine a worker coming to an employer and sitting down and going over with that employer the conditions of a job that this worker would like to have. And they go over what work you'll do and what time you have to come in the morning and where you'll sit and what tools you'll use, etc. And then they get to that very important question, how much am I going to get paid? And let's make it simple. The employer and the employee agree on $20 per hour. The worker will come, do his, her work, get paid 20 hours, let's say for 40 hours a week, uh, and that is what the worker gets. Marx's answer to this situation, or his analysis is, runs like this. 
The reason the employer is able and willing to give the worker $20 an hour is because during that hour, each hour, the worker will add to the value of what that capitalist sells a quantity of value larger than $20. In other words, the value added by the worker's labor is greater than the value paid to the worker for doing that. And in that difference lies the profit of the employer. The last thing I'll say is one of the virtues of this way of understanding capitalism is that it shows you the parallel that capitalism has to slavery and to feudalism. In slavery, the slave produces output, a part of which is returned to him so he can continue slaving. The master gets the other part. In feudalism, the serf does a lot of work and keeps part of what he produces and delivers the other as a rental payment to the Lord. In capitalism, you get the same thing, but it's more obscure, hence the need for analysis. And the value added versus value paid allows you to understand how and why not only capitalism could not break from the dualism and the dichotomy of master slave and serf and lord, but it also answers the question why liberty, equality, fraternity, and democracy weren't brought, because you didn't make the break from those earlier class divided systems that you thought capitalism might achieve, because capitalism brought us a new dichotomy. Instead of master slave and serf lord, we get employer and employee and therein lies the answer to why capitalism could not deliver on the promise of its origination, if you like, at least in the European scenario of the 18th and 19th centuries. So let me stop with that. All right, Dr. Wolf, thank you very much. Anthony, feel free to give your opening statement slash rebuttal to Dr. Wolf's statement, however you'd like to take the frame it, take it away. Thank you. Okay, first of all, like Dr. Wolf, I'm particularly interested in relieving poverty. In my, and a lot of people say, will know that my, the emphasis of my libertarian advocacy is on policies that I, I believe, though they are more free market than the situation we have now, would put an emphasis on helping the people at the bottom of the economic ladder. Now, in this statement, I'm going to have to put my position out at length because it's quite, it's harder to debunk an idea than it is to state it. And I thank um, Richard for putting it so clearly. Um, but for the remainder of this, I probably would like to hear more from Dr. Wolf. So I'm going to try and be as brief as possible. First of all, the term exploitation is quite a slippery, ill-defined term. And that's worth looking at because it's quite commonly used. Now, we can use exploitation to simply mean employ to one's greatest possible advantage. So uh, I can exploit my talents. Richard exploits his talents as an orator and as an economic thinker. Or it can mean to advertise and promote. For example, a band can use their new album to exploit their back catalog. Now, obviously, no one has a problem with those definitions of exploitation. It's the third one that people worry about, which, so far as I can tell, means to make use of a situation in a, unselfish, in a selfish or unfair way, right? Um, that's, that's the, that's the dick. So, um, but even within this usage of the word, which I think is the one that Marxists have a problem with, uh, uh, Dr. Wolf gave a more clear um, account of why, it's still slippery because in the context of economic relations, I hear the word exploit used in three ways. The first is to take something from someone else against their will. And we could just say theft instead, but we don't always. The second is to enter someone into an agreement on false pretenses 
and then to hold them accountable to the terms of that agreement, even though it's to their own detriment. Now, we can call that fraud, but we don't. The third is to give someone the less beneficial end of a transaction, uh, which they still benefit from, but not to the same degree that you do. Um, they may enter into that voluntarily. So for example, in Richard's example, they're getting paid $20, but the capitalist is profiting, indeed if he does profit, because his idea, his, ca his business might fail, he might not get a profit. But if he did, he's going to profit more than he paid them. Now, it's in the third case where anti-capitalists usually have a problem with exploitation, but they benefit from the fact that the word is also tied to other usages, which mean theft and fraud in a rhetorical way. Now, I would never accuse Dr. Wolf of doing that because he's been very clear on what he means from exploitation. But I just want to say that even so, even though it's true that workers don't get paid the total value of what they produce, doesn't mean that anything untoward is going on or that they're being exploited um, in the way that we've described, and I'll, I'll explain why um, as briefly as I can. There's many reasons. The first is that other resources are involved. Factories and resources have to be bought, overheads have to be paid, um, the, the, the capitalist needs to market the product and link it to potential buyers. So what they're doing is they're adding something to the labor of their employees. And if the product doesn't sell, everyone else has already been paid, but the capitalist walks away with the loss. Now, I don't like when libertarians say, oh, but the capitalist gets a profit because he's taking the risk. Because what's a risk worth? It's a completely arbitrary evaluation to risk. But it is true that instead of buying a factory, they could buy a yacht or a summer house. They're putting their property on the line and it's the fact that their property is being used to create goods and services that gives them uh, an entitlement to profit if a profit is made. Now, when Marxists hold that capitalists simply skim profit off the top, um, that by doing so they're extracting surplus value, um, this is the Marxist, the old Marxist believe, so far as I'm aware, that eliminating the dead weight of capitalists who are just skimming off the top would allow societies to be incredibly prosperous because you'd get rid of the dead weight of the capitalists. That's obviously not proven to be true in economic systems where it's been tried. So the, the capitalists must be providing something, some competence, um, something that they're adding. So, and, and I would say that that is that the capitalist has to actually guess what people want. He lays out a vision of what he thinks that people are going to buy rather than anything else. It's not an easy thing to do. Some of them succeed, some of them fail, as we well know. So I think they're contributing a labor contribution in their vision. Um, they organize production, linking several suppliers to consumers who can get, who combine their labor together. They find factory staff, sales staff, receptionists, managers, IT staff. They, they have to have the vision to see who might, who might be able to do this. So uh, all of these people, their labor would be worth less if not for someone to come along and um, organize them. <laughs> Richard, I, I, I see is um, gripped. Maybe he will accuse me of being a bootlicker to authoritarians here. I'm looking forward to his response. I'm sorry to take so long, but this is, um, this is part of developing my overall argument. So just a couple more points, if you don't mind. Um, okay, so another thing that he, the capitalist is being paid for is the time value of money. When given the choice, we'd all rather have something now than later on. So he has to forego consumption in the short term, whereas his staff get cons consumption in the short term. And as, a, as I repeat, um, he might not even get the payoff in the end if his vision isn't clear, if he doesn't act, can't actually guess what consumers, who are also to a large degree workers, want, um, then he will fail. So he's also ultimately responsible in the case of litigation against the company, if, or at least he should be. Maybe in this 
um, messed up economy where the government's in bed with big business, he's not always responsible. But at least on a free market, he should be held responsible. He's the shield. So finally, far from making workers worse off, the capitalist actually increases their value because if a man decides to go out into a field and do these motions, no one's going to pay him for it. But coming into the factory and doing these motions, he may be worth more money. And also, as I mentioned, combining with the labor of others and the other factors of production. So um, one final point. If I employ a plumber, I exploit his labor because I want as much from the plumber. He can fix as many pipes as he can, but he's also exploiting my need for a plumber and he will want to get paid as much as his skills are worth. Likewise, um, employers have a need for employees which um, employees uh, will gain as much money as their skills are worth as much they're, they're likely to go to the employer who can pay them the best or offer them the best conditions. So for all these reasons that I've stated, I would conclude that capitalists don't exploit workers on a free market at least, but they enter with workers into a mutually beneficial exchange. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Anthony. And uh, Dr. Wolf, there's a lot of different kind of points that uh, Anthony went through there. So um, you can take it any direction you want. I think it might be a good idea to sort of start by honing in on the term exploitation, <laughs> excuse me, on the term exploitation, because as Anthony pointed out there, there are sort of several ways that you can use that word, some of which a lot of us wouldn't object to it when we actually break down the act and others we might. So do you care to sort of dive into that a little sure. bit deeper? Sure, let's do that. The word exploitation, Anthony is absolutely right, is used in a variety of ways. It has been for a long time. Uh, but from the Marxian theory, if that's what people are interested in talking about, then there's one definition, and it is really crystal clear. It's contained in the early chapters of volume one of Capital. Marx lays it out, and it is what I summarized before. It is very simple. It's the difference between, and you can uh, make it arithmetic if you like. Marx gives arithmetic examples. It's a difference between the value added by a worker's labor and the value paid to that worker in the wage or salary he or she gets. If the value added is larger than what is paid, then then exploitation exists. That's a definition. You don't have to agree with it, of course, but it's the definition that Marx uses and uses systematically. And so for him, for example, whether the market is free or unfree, whatever exactly that means, uh, or whether there's no market at all, whether other systems of distributing resources and products are in play, that's a separate question from whether or not more value has been added in the production process by workers than they are paid for producing. And on that basis, exploitation either exists uh, or it doesn't exist, number one. Number two, uh, let me borrow Anthony's uh, comment about slippery or, or slippery definitions. Um, the, the capitalist wants us to believe, uh, and Anthony's quite right, that this is an old story, that they really add something very important and essential that they are not to be understood as ripping off the worker through exploitation, but are rather to be understood as providing a vital service of some sort. Uh, this is interesting. Uh, masters thought that they were contributing something really important to slavery. They, would, they resisted the notion that they were ripping off the slaves. They preferred to think of it that the slaves were, you know, kind of like children, and they needed a parent, and the master was in loco parentis, uh, taking care of these mm, only half human beings who couldn't kind of manage all of this on their own, and would have been lost were it not for the master who understood the complexities of the larger system. Uh, it took a long period of revolutions to disabuse the world of the notion that the master was actually doing a service to the slave rather than the other way around. I won't bore you by repeating the same story for feudalism, but it would be easy to do. 
for me to hear about the capitalist performing some vital function reminds me of the master and the Lord in feudalism. I don't think it's true. I don't, I don't find it to be the case. And let me give you a concrete example. In the old days, when capitalists were a family or an individual who did work with or alongside the workers, you could understand some of that because there was productive work being done by the capitalists. But in a modern corporation, that's long over with. The board of directors that appropriates the surplus doesn't do any work. In most cases, doesn't even know what the corporation is doing. It hires people to do all of that. That's what a CEO and the other officials at the top are there for. They, the board, which gathers into its hands the net revenue, or if you like, the surplus value, is precisely there to do nothing else, right? namely to literally sit there. By the way, big corporations have tens or hundreds of thousands of, of employees. The board of directors is usually 15 to 20 individuals who gather the surplus, which is theirs legally, as well as organizationally and structurally. And they then decide what to do with it in whatever way they like. They typically get together four or five times a year for a relatively short amount of time. They are not paid a salary, they are paid a director's fee. Their job is to become what Marxist theory foresaw, the pure capitalist who appropriates uh, the surplus of other people. Last thing, Anthony, and I mean, there were other things Anthony said I would like to respond to, but I don't wanna take more time than is reasonable. He, he referred in passing to something about workers taking over uh, without a capitalist or not needing a capitalist. And he mentioned, I believe his word was, that has been tried uh, elsewhere and it hasn't worked out. Uh, I, don't, I don't understand exactly what that means, but I think I'm pretty sure I don't agree with it. If what he means is the Soviet Union or the People's Republic of China or things like that, then I would dispute that exploitation was removed in that society. If you replace private individuals elected by shareholders who comprise a board, of, uh, a board of directors of a corporation with instead of that state officials or political party officials, you have changed who the exploiter is, but you haven't gotten rid of the exploitation, at least if you use the Marxist definition. If you want to see an example of where capitalists have been done without, then the place to look at is worker co-ops. It's to go to Mondragon in Spain or to uh, Emilia Romagna in Italy where you can see uh, an active organized production system in which the workers who produce the value are simultaneously part of a cooperative that appropriates their own surplus. And in that situation, they have worked Mondragon was a cooperative of six workers and a Catholic priest uh, in 1956 in a little city in northern Spain. It is today the seventh largest corporation in Spain. Uh, it is an extraordinary story of success that would make most capitalist enterprises green with envy. And Emilia Romagna is a province of Italy in which 40% of the economy is organized as worker co-ops who pride themselves on having done away with capitalists as an alternative body within their framework. So if you're going to judge the few empirical examples that we actually have to look at this, you have to be fair enough to look where it actually has been done and not to look where the, in the name of Marxism, something quite different was, was arranged, with had its strengths and weaknesses too, but is really not relevant to the question of trying to organize a system where the redundancy of the capitalist is put into practice. I think libertarians can somewhat relate um, to this idea that you, you hear something's been tried and people point to an example that you will then say, well, that, that's not what I mean at all. Uh, for you, it might be the Soviet Union or the People's Republic of China. For libertarians, it might be Somalia. But I think we can all relate to the idea of being told that this is, the, this is what you want when it's not really what we want. So do you want to start there, Anthony, just addressing, since yeah, that was a yeah, comment that you had made that this has been tried before, do you want to just kind of delve into yeah, that? I, I did mean, I'd specifically meant that more wealth would be created if we chucked it the 
capitalist and I did mean in places like the Soviet Union or Cuba. I don't want to equivocate if that's not what you meant. Um, I think that you know, libertarians can relate more than that because we hear, well, capitalist has been tried not just in Somalia, here in our nations, but it's not the kind of capitalism that we would like to see. We want, probably like um, uh, Dr. Wolf, at least the government out of bed with big business. I think we can all agree on that. Now, absolutely, I'm very- Absolutely, we can. I'm excited by a lot of what, you, uh, Richard has said because there's so many things we're really getting into the issue here so I think that cooperatives are completely congruent with the free market there's nothing in a free market that bans cooperatives the fact that they haven't been adopted more widely may be product of our education system which is very authoritarian and uh, structured like a pyramid, I'd say, after 11 to 13 years of being bossed around in school, most people are, and doing very individual work, most people aren't quite ready to go out into the world and uh, start a workplace that's cooperative. Maybe either they're used to taking orders, so they take a job as a worker, or they want to be the one giving orders, so they take a job as, as a boss. I don't know if, in a, if on a free market, perhaps, more cooperatives would exist. However, there's many, I, th I would say that if it was so easy for workers to organize workplaces, I don't see why they're not going to the banks on masses as groups and purchasing their workplaces, getting rid of the capitalists who are just skimming eight to 12% in profits off the top and making a fortune because they've, they've cut the debt weight. Um, I think that um, you're really underestimating what goes into uh, selling a successful product because if it was that easy, more people would do it. You have to, you, you do need some, I, I, I agree that there are, um, that, there, that there are complexities. I disagree with you that there aren't complexities. I think it is a skill. Um, we might have reached an impasse on that point, but I, I want to pick up on two more points you made. One is the idea of the board of directors only extracting surplus value because they're not working in the company. They've just put up the capital. Now, that itself is meant to serve as a vetting process for ideas. Those people are putting their money on the line and people are coming to them, their angel investors and saying, I've got this idea for a business. I've got that idea for a business. And they're gonna say, well, you know, I'll give you 20 million to fund that business in exchange for 40% or then someone else will say for 38%. Now, this is really part of the market process for stopping resources getting wasted by putting large sums of money into businesses that go nowhere. These people have accumulated their wealth by picking out good ideas for businesses and investing into them. Now, the Marxian fallacy, in my view, and this is obviously articulated by the Austrian economist whom I'm a fan of, is that you don't have to own the means of production to benefit from the means of production. When these investors invest in machines and factories that are innovative and push the price of goods and services down, all those workers who can get those goods and services for cheaper benefit too, even though they don't own the means of production. So that means that's why the, the work week has fallen from 62 hours to 37 hours, because we can make so much more stuff because we've got all the technology there. So I, I think that the board of directors, I know it's easy to look at the investors as just um, profiting without labor, but they're actually serving a very important function in the market, which is herding money towards good ideas, which are ideas that people want to buy, and, um, and they show their qualification by doing so repeatedly. If they fail to do so, they lose all their money. The machines and factories get bought up by, doing, by someone who does a better job. Now, I know you want to respond to that, but I just want to respond to you analogizing um, employment, which is a voluntary contract, in my view, uh, to slavery or feudalism, um, you know, because 
I, actually, I want to know why you think that giving someone a job which they can voluntarily take, they can, they can look around for what is the best given their skills. And if they get more skills, they can probably get a better job, right? Why is that exploitative when it's a voluntary contract, but having to be forced at gunpoint to pay taxes, 40% of your income, let's say, or once you include VAT sales tax and all the taxes, for many people, that's not exploitative. I think the analogy is not between um, a slaver and a capitalist, but a slaver and a government. We just used to have monarchs as governments. Um, if, you, if the monarch owns 100% of your labor, then you're a slave. So if the government is entitled to 40% of your labor, then you're 40% a slave. Dr. Wolf, there's a few directions you can go, so I'll let you take that wherever you want. <laughs> okay. Um, one thing is just, just for, for, for the historical record. The reason that workers only work 40 hours a week instead of 80 is because they struggled unbelievably against normal odds for many decades to get that. That was never an offer the capitalists made. It is something they resisted from day one. Uh, tomorrow is May Day. That is a celebration started in the United States when workers in Chicago back in the 1870s were fighting for the eight hour day and got caught up in a demonstration. Some police people got killed. Some anarchists were arrested and executed and it became a national holiday. But it's part of a long struggle that really is not about the mechanisms of capitalism, which have everywhere fought shortening the workday ruthlessly. The history of England is the history of the 12 hours struggle and the 10 hours struggle and the eight hours. I mean, it, it, it's relentless. And it was always the capitalists on the wrong side of that struggle having to be defeated to get it down. Uh, to that. And here in the United States, we now have a struggle over what's called compulsory overtime, which is in effect another way of strengthen, uh, lengthening the working day. And Marx, by the way, had a wonderful chapter early in volume one of Capital about the struggle over the length of the working day where he, where he works all of that out. Do you care to adjust that one point, Anthony, just so we don't get bogged down in you know, four or five things that we want to respond to about the point of, you know, you, you kind of laid it out as, as workers gained shorter work weeks based on sort of the, uh, I guess you might say, the economic improvements that capitalism brought, whereas Richard would take another stance that it was really just them organizing and fighting for those hours, not so much the improvements of capitalism. Yeah, I'll, I'll just dispute that point as quickly as I can. If that were true, then we could have had a 37 uh, hour work week or lower when we were an agrarian um, economy. No, you can't because you need to farm more than that to go food. Similarly, without the technology, you could vote, you could protest all you want for a 35 hour work week in 1800. But without the machines to create that much wealth, there's no way you could have got it. A forklift allows one person to do the labor that maybe 40 people would have taken to do without the forklift. So it's only with that machinery in place that we can then go out and protest and things like that and get the work week gradually shortened. I think when we actually look at history, what we find is most of the things like um, most of the mo most children weren't working by the time we got laws to ban child labor only a small percentage were most the um, deaths at work had fallen uh, to a large degree before we got osha and the work week had already begun to fall and um, just because of just because people then have a choice how they want to sp spend their time. Now, the, I just think that the government is just slightly behind and slightly behind and then can mandate those improvements once the economy is wealthy enough to allow for those movements. But people couldn't go out to Bangladesh now and campaign for a four day work week because they just don't have the productive capacity and uh, when they tried to ban child labor, for example, in Bangladesh, sadly, tons of children went into prostitution and um, theft or starvation because at, at their stage, unfortunately, their families couldn't make enough money without all hands on deck. All hands on deck were on deck when we were in an agrarian society. I'm glad 
that we've got to the point where we do work 37 hours a week rather than uh, Anthony, 60. Anthony, I want to stay. I want to stay friends with you. So yeah. I'm going to. I'm yeah. going to be as polite as I know how. Please do. Okay. Please do. This. I find this extraordinary kind of reasoning, really okay, extraordinary, please, please. and it doesn't, it doesn't work with the way capitalism works. And let me e explain it to you in the hopes that you, you get the idea. For a capitalist, it's always best to take a new invention, one that, say, makes workers twice as productive as they were before. Let's take a simple example. A factory, work, 100 workers producing output. We have a new technology that allows workers to be twice as productive as they were before. What does the capitalist do? He fires half of the workers and buys the machine because with half the workers, he can produce just as much as he did before, sell it at the same price, get the same revenue, but his profit will go up because half of the revenue that he used to need to pay the workers, he doesn't need because he fired half of them. So that's what he does. For the workers, if they ran the factory, they would never do that. Why? Because for them, there's another solution that would lead to the same revenue and the same product. Everybody works half a day. Then they get the same output because working half the hours with a machine makes you twice as productive. So they would decide if they were in charge to take the benefit of the technology in the form of major increases in leisure. Okay? We don't have a capitalist system that allows the second option to become operative because capitalists don't permit that. And then therefore to have less work the workers have to fight for it because there is no incentive in capitalism for the capitalist to ever give it to them, which is why they've always fought against it and never acted in the way you just described as though they were the beneficiaries of doing, uh, uh, of doing such a thing, number one. Number two, let, let, let me make a couple of more uh, points because they're important here. Um, the capitalists, you know, I love this argument, they take risks. Everybody takes risks. If a business collapses, it's not just the capitalist who loses his money, it's the workers who lose their job. Those workers have had, decided to have children, assuming they would have a job, they don't have one. They made investments in a home, assuming they would have a job, they don't have one. It's a peculiar arrangement in which the capitalist risks an amount of money he presumably can afford to risk. But the worker is also involved in the risk, but is excluded from the decisions about what risk to take. Because we allow the risk taking to be monopolized by a small minority, the capitalists, even though the consequences of a mistake are nicely socialized to all the employees. If we were to have any remote notion of justice, we would never allow that. If all the people suffer the results of a bad risk, then all of them have to participate in making the decision that is risky. We don't have that in capitalism, which is why it is so fundamentally contradictory to democracy. Anthony, I'll let you take that wherever you want. Okay, well, there's a lot there, so... Um, Okay, let's go with the automation thing. Yes, it's true that the capitalist will like to automate away workers, but that's only looking at one side of the equation. The, the, the automation will bring down the price of goods and services and has throughout history. That's why you can get a flat screen TV for $87 rather than $1,000, um, so, which it costs when it came out. So that, me, that is how the market actually socializes to use your words the benefit of automation it pushes the prices of goods and services down and that means that people have to work less to afford those goods and services now uh, professor wolf says um that in the market Anthony, you do know that for every example you can give me of where a technical innovation has brought prices down I can give you an example of where a technological innovation has been systematically kept from doing that because it's profitable for those who endeavor right. to do so. You know that. Do you, do well, you want to give us example, an example? 
for, for with patents and intellectual property, which you know I think are granted by government, I would be very happy to see those um, limited or abolished. For example, I don't think they're a feature of the free market. I think they're a, a, a government intervention. But we may have slightly different definitions of capitalism. No, that's fine. I agree with you. But I mean, it has been the normal, regular performance of capitalism to give precisely right. those protections to capitalists, so, which have meant the inventions haven't had the effect you've just mentioned. Right. OK. Well, yes, but that is in a heavily um, statist system. And we can both define capitalism and as the free market and at the same time as interventions into the free market by the state. I know most people do and we could probably have a whole conversation on how capitalism should be yes. defined but I fear that we would stray from the point. I yeah, had that's an another two hour debate that we can schedule. I had, a, <laughs> I had another point which is you seem to be uh, putting forward the notion which I think um, you know Marx did which is that um, the capitalist is going to drive the wages to the bottom. It's a race to the bottom, the iron law of wages, and, and workers will get paid as little as they can commonly afford. Now, the economist George Reisman has a counter argument for this. If I move to New York where you live, and I have a nice car, but I just don't want the car. I want to get rid of the car, okay? Uh, I'm willing to give that car away, but the thing is, the value of that car is still four or five thousand dollars. So I can lucky me. So I, I just because I'm willing to give the car away, uh, because I it uh, doesn't mean that I have to. The the wages aren't an arbitrary figure. They are a reflection of how much value someone's skill, someone's labor are. So it doesn't stand to reason um, that. Um, they're going that workers just because they're willing to pay to work 60 hours a week because they've got no choice will have to if the if automation is spreading these benefits making everything cheaper and so forth just because they if they you know when push comes to sub they've been willing to they don't have to anymore there are plenty of workplaces that will give them 40 hour work weeks and um, so that is how I see the growth and wealth in society translating to workers getting more rights, better conditions. Yes, they might, the government might mandate them based on protests, but only once uh, capitalism has created enough wealth to, the, to allow the government to make those mandates. Um, if, if, and, I, if I could just respond, and I know we're running out of time, but respond just with a little piece of empirical example uh, on this. Since the 1970s in the United States, the productivity of our workers has gone up somewhere around one and a half to two and a half percent per year, pretty much for 40, 50 years. Meanwhile, the real wage, that is the amount of money wage adjusted for the prices a worker has to pay, that's what real wage means, has basically been flat. The, the real wage of an American worker today is roughly what it was in the late 1970s. So for the last 40 years, the rising productivity has translated into nothing in the terms of an increase in the wage of the worker. And the reason for that has been that capitalists have found a way, which they are always looking for, to avoid having to share any of the increase in productivity with the working class. And the way that was accomplished was by moving a large part of production out of the United States to China and India and Brazil and places like that, as well as to make the adjustments that I talked about before in terms of technology and firing people and bringing in immigrants and all the rest of that wonderful collection of activities that capitalism uh, gives us. But here's a concrete example in this country, which is shaping our politics today in ways that ought to frighten everybody, you have created a monster here. You have had a capitalism promising the working class a rising standard of living, having done so for most of the 19th and 20th century, having stopped doing it in the 1970s, and now producing a fantastic destruction of American culture and politics because of capitalism's inability to share 
in the mechanism you just described, rising productivity in the form of a rising standard of living. The only way the American working class hasn't had the collapse of the standard of living on a scale even greater than what you've suffered in England, in Britain since the, the, the 2008 uh, crash, is because Americans have become pioneers in a new way. Instead of going across the prairie in a, in a wagon, they borrowed more money than any working class on earth had ever done before, which is not a solution that anyone ought to celebrate and which is now causing even more troubles for American capitalism than it already had. And that's a point that Antti may actually agree with you on. Uh, uh, Rich, Dr. Wolf, I just want to, how, how hard is your out time? Because I do want to make sure you guys are able to get a good, you know, closing well, look, statement. I, I have to go because I have another interview okay. that I've, I've committed to do. Right. But if you were, were interested in continuing this conversation, and I, I say this to Anthony uh, as much as to you, I would be glad to do so. Absolutely, if, absolutely. If reschedule it. Uh, I think it would be, I hope it would be of interest to your, your audience. Uh, but I, for one, I'm, I'm more than willing to do it. Great. So why don't we let you just give a brief closing statement right now, and then I'll let Anthony kind of give his. And if you need to get off sort of in the middle of it, you know, we'll do that. But I'm definitely open to uh, continuing this. I think in many ways we just sort of scratched the surface, and there's a lot, definitely a lot more we could dig into here. Yeah, what I like about this, and let me end with it in a positive note. I think Anthony at one point said something interesting, which is that there was he can see areas of agreement or, or between us, between him and me. I think so too. And I think that it has always struck me that the association of libertarians so often with the extreme right wing when it comes to capitalism is, is not necessary. I, I don't think it's built into the logic. And I think though there are many of us on the left who are more than willing to talk about meeting each other halfway. Uh, we won't agree on everything, of course not. <clears throat> but we can both live with that. And there ought to be a more balanced discussion between libertarians and those of us on the left than there has been. Uh, and it doesn't need to be the assumption that so many Americans have that if you're a libertarian, you're some extreme right winger, as if that were some sort of uncomplicated continuum. I absolutely agree with that. I think based on our nodding heads, Anthony would agree as well. Uh, Dr. Wolf, if you need to head off, I totally understand. I know you have other obligations, but Anthony, I'll let you, uh, you know, give, give you a little response and sum up your views on this. And I definitely yeah. would, again, love to, love to uh, continue this at some point. Yes, I think um, the left are certainly very aligned with libertarian positions on foreign policy and on civil liberties, traditionally. Um, we both agree that the government shouldn't be giving massive handouts to big business or bailing out banks or giving special advantages to, corpor to corporations. So I think there is some common ground there. I found the conversation thrilling. I would love to pick up the threads, including your last thread. Uh, I urge people, I, I, I would probably put down wage stagnation to different factors than you, things like the Federal Reserve in your country, the Bank of England here, printing shed loads of money in yep. that period, which uh, devalues the currency. But I see that as a state action because they are mandated to do that by the state. I don't see that as part of the natural function of the market. And so that might be something that we can talk about. You know, when we use the term capitalism, do we mean what we have now, which you know, we often do. But um, I think that it's important to tease out the cause and effect of things and not just simply say, oh, well, that's capitalism, that's socialism. So I would love to um, get into the reads uh, more. And I'm delighted that you offered to continue this conversation because I think we're hitting on the true points of the day. And I think that uh, we, understand, we communicate and understand well enough one another to actually talk on each other's points rather than straw man one another. Agreed, agreed. Absolutely, and uh, you know, when, once we get off here of this call, I'll, I'll reach out to both of you and maybe we'll try to schedule a part two because I think we, like I said, we only really scratched the surface here. Dr. Wolf, I know you got to go, but I, again, I really want to thank you for coming on and doing this. I think uh, one thing we all three of us agree on is this is the kind of conversation that 
we could all use more of. And by we, I just mean everyone engaged in the political conversation, more conversation where we're trying to understand each other as opposed to just trying to bloviate about you know our views and, and throw them at each other and, and run away. So again, I really do appreciate both of you coming on here today and very politely discussing this subject. Thank you guys so much. Keep up the great work, both of you. Keep on roaring in your own ways, of course. All right. Thank you again for the opportunity. Absolutely. Take care.